from uh, Stanford University. Uh, so as I mentioned, title of this talk is Weaving Together Machine Learning, Theoretical Physics and uh, Neuroscience. Uh, so I uh, have, have the, the bio here, but just to keep it short. So uh, Sergey Ganguly uh, majored in uh, uh, three areas of so physics, mathematics, and uh, ECS at, uh, at MIT. He did a postdoc in theoretical neuroscience at uh, UCSF. Now associate professor uh, applied physics at, uh, at Stanford and he leads the neural dynamics and uh, computation, uh, computation lab. Um, so he has been awarded many awards, like the Schwartz Fellowship in Computational Neuroscience, the Burrow Welcome Career Award, a Terman Award, and the NeurIPS Outstanding Paper Award, Sloan Fellowship, uh, and the James uh, McDonald Foundation Scholar uh, Award, McKnight Scholar Award in Neuroscience, uh, and uh, the Simons Investigator Award in the Mathematical Modeling of Living Systems, and finally the uh, NSF Career uh, Award. All right, so now I'll uh, give the floor to Surya. So, okay, so now you should be able to Okay, great. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, yeah, thanks for the introduction. So let's see. Let me, um, okay, great. So can you uh, see my slides? Uh, yes, perfect. Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. Uh, yeah, so I was going to talk about sort of a, a diversity of topics that, that intersect uh, in different ways with uh, uh, physics uh, here. So, you know, a lot of what my lab does is uh, we work very closely with experimental neuroscientists, uh, working closely with their data, making predictions trying to understand how various neural circuits work, how you know the retina sees, how flies detect motion, how mice navigate, how monkeys reach, how mice learn, uh, and so forth. But we've also been sort of very interested in sort of a, an alliance between neuroscience and machine learning that also cuts across physics, uh, as, as I'll discuss. And the basic idea is, in, in some sense, we're in this field because we you know, we kind of want to understand how the brain works. That's what we'd, we'd like to understand. But, but what does that really mean? Well, a more proximal version of that question is we'd like to understand how the connectivity and dynamics of neural circuits give rise to behavior. And also learning is very important. We'd like to understand how neural activity and synaptic learning rules conspire to self-organize useful connectivity that subserves behavior. You know, what's interesting is that the field of machine learning has generated lots of interesting learned neural networks that accomplish very interesting tasks, tasks we know of no other way of doing in any other artificial system at the moment. What should be sobering for us in neuroscience and also uh, in machine learning is we know everything about them. We know their connectivity, their dynamics, their learning rule, their entire developmental experience from random initialization to final training. Yet we don't have a meaningful understanding of how they learn and work. And it's a little bit worse than that even. We don't even have a, a benchmark for what successful understanding might even look like uh, at the moment. So we wrote a, uh, an opinion piece uh, you know, on these topics and, and suggested some ways uh, forward. So um, let's see, okay. So, so in parallel, we've actually been working a lot on the, the theory of deep learning. Uh, and, and so we've been applying a lot of ideas from the physical sciences and, and applied mathematics. You know, Some of the ideas are here on the physics side, things like non equilibrium system mechanics, dynamic mean field theory, statistical mechanics of random landscapes, and also mathematical topics. And we've been using them to gain an understanding uh, into how neural networks work. So that's how, how physics intersects with uh, a, a lot of this work. Uh, but also we've been trying to exploit, uh, in collaboration, trying to exploit novel physics to create new kinds of uh, quantum neuromorphic computers. And I'll talk about that as well. So um, if you're interested in, in kind of, we wrote a recent summary with my colleagues uh, uh, when I was at Google. Um, we, we wrote a review of, uh, especially the, the side of, uh, using physics to understand neural networks as opposed to exploiting physics to create new neural networks. Uh, but, but for that set of topics, we wrote a review for annual reviews of dense matter physics, uh, if you're interested, that talked about a variety of fundamental problems in, um, in deep learning uh, and, and how uh, ideas from system mechanics could help uh, uh, shed light on them. So for example, what can deep neural networks say that shallow neural networks cannot? Can we understand the geometry of the error landscape of neural networks? How do we understand signal propagation and exploit that to optimally initialize deep networks? Theories of generalization in deep learning and uh, uh, probabilistic uh, generative models. How do we understand them and create them? So, uh, so yeah, I'll, 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 I suggest that as a, as a biased suggestion for, for a review article that summarizes kind of this body of work. 
Okay, but for today, what I wanted to do was give you sort of four vignettes. Um, the, the, the first one, we're going to start off simple with just, you know, regression in high dimensions. Uh, but we're going to use ideas from physics uh, to, to really understand what is the best possible way to do regression in high dimensionals. So we're going to use ideas from the statistical mechanics of disordered systems. And we're going to use that to, to come up with actually better algorithms uh, for regression high dimensions. Uh, then we're going to show how constraints on the, we're going to shift topics uh, uh, to neuroscience. And we're going to show how constraints from the physical world, namely the statistical structure of natural movies, can really sculpt uh, the primate retina. In fact, we can derive uh, some detailed aspects of the structure and function of the primate retina just from um, uh, optimizing the performance of model retinas, taking into account the statistical structure of the physical world. So physics determines biology in, in, in this sense uh, through machine learning. Okay, another aspect of neuroscience that's quite interesting is that, that we all have uh, sort of hexagonal lattices of firing patterns in our brains. Um, many species have these in areas that are thought to control navigation. Uh, so these are these famous Nobel Prize winning grid cells. But an open question is, you know, how can, you know, why are these grid cells there? Uh, we'll try to give an answer to this question uh, using a combination of machine learning and nonlinear pattern formation theory uh, to explain the emergence of hexagonal grid cells. So these are ideas from the, uh, the physics of pattern formation that, that help understand actually neural networks that are solving a problem that animals actually solve. So there'll be neuroscience, physics, and machine learning in that section. Then finally, at the end, which, which is probably, um, yeah, and finally, at the end, I'll talk about trying to realize uh, uh, neural networks using very different degrees of freedom than the ones that either biology found uh, or, you know, that are found in our current GPUs. Namely, can we create sort of quantum neuromorphic computers where the computation happens through the interactions of atoms and photons? And uh, of course, all the experimental work is done in collaboration with my colleagues in applied physics. Uh, but we've been, uh, you know, doing some theoretical work and simulations to understand the dynamics of these quantum neuromorphic computers, especially in their classical limits. And so I'll go through that uh, at the end. So that's basically the, the structure. So let's get started. So um, high dimensional statistical analysis is, is kind of a, a fundamental topic that cuts across many, many different fields because of experimental revolutions in our ability to collect large scale data sets. Right, so, so this high dimensional statistics has a formal kind of, is a formal limit in statistics. So consider, for example, data sets where P is the dimensionality of the data. It's a number of variables that you collect simultaneously when you collect any particular data point. And let's let N be the number of data points. An important parameter is the measurement density, the ratio of the number of data points that you collect to the dimension of each data point. So in classical experimental design, we used to carefully decide ahead of time a very important small number of variables that we'd like to measure simultaneously in order to understand any physical or biological system. And we'd measure those small number of variables in as many, many possible situations as we could. In it, so this is low dimensional data where the dimensionality is order one, but the number of data points is going to infinity or is quite large. So the measurement density is infinite. And in this setting, it's very easy to do regression or clustering and see patterns in the data. But what's happening now is that we're measuring many, many variables at once, right? We sort of take data first and ask questions later. We measure many variables at once. For example, we can, you, can, you can measure sort of all of the genes in yeast, for example, or you can measure thousands of neurons in the brain without knowing ahead of time whether these genes or neurons are at all relevant for the scientific question you're, you're, you're asking, whether all of them are, maybe some subset of them are. Um, we can collect them in, in many experimental conditions, but actually sometimes we're quite limited in how many experimental conditions we can collect the data. So what's happening is uh, both the dimensionality and the number of data points are going off to infinity, but their ratio is order one. So for example, in neuroscience, we can measure thousands of neurons in hundreds of trials. So we actually have fewer data points and dimensions. So a caricature of such data sets that we can at least visualize is something like three data points in three dimensions, right? So a, a basic question is how can we do uh, efficient data analysis in this regime? So there's a very nice uh, strand of work uh, you know, that stems from the physics literature 
that tries to understand data analysis in this regime, exploiting the following analogy between machine learning and, and the statistical physics of systems of quench disorder. So machine learning often boils down to learning the statistical parameters of a model by maximizing the log likelihood of data given the parameters, right? But if we just sort of redefine the minus log probability of the data given the parameters as an energy, right? The data is what it is. It's what you're given. It's generated from some process uh, generated by nature. Um, and, and so the data is like quench disorder in this random energy function, right? And the parameters with respect to which you're trying to minimize the energy are like thermal degrees of freedom. And so you can map a lot of a lot of data analysis problems. I mean, this is a trivial like change of change of language, but there exists a lot of techniques from the statistical physics of random systems with quench disorder to to compute uh, these minima, to compute their properties, and so forth. And uh, so we can exploit a lot of mathematical techniques here once we form this dictionary between machine learning and physics. Uh, we, we've been uh, participants in this kind of journey uh, in, in, in the sequence of papers and more. Um, I'm going to talk about one of these here. Okay. Uh, and it also, if you're interested, um, uh, you know, we a while ago we wrote a review article where we talked about this connection much more in much more detailed fashion, where we used the I, mathematical techniques from the analyzing the physical physics of systems of quench disorder, namely the replica method. Uh, and we, in a unified way, we discussed how the replica method can be used to understand spin glass models of neural networks, statistical mechanics of learning, random matrix theory, random projections, compressed sensing, and, and, and various other topics. Uh, and we gave a tutorial on the replica method here. So this was published a while ago. Okay, so, so let's, so, so, okay, so with that in mind, with that background in mind, let's talk about the best way we can possibly do regression in, in, in high dimensions. Okay, so uh, we're going to do theory. So I'm going to assume a model of the data, right? Uh, so I'm going to assume a situation where we have a generative model of the data. So on the right hand side here, we're going to assume that we have some p dimensional unknown signal or unknown regression vector S0. Okay, it's going to come some, from some distribution, which I'll talk about in a, in a bit. So, so we have this unknown regression vector, and we get to probe this unknown regression vector by feeding it inputs x mu. And these inputs will be sort of random inputs, uh, IID, white noise, random inputs. So it's like white noise systems identification. Okay, and then we measure the outputs, but, but the outputs are corrupted by noise. Okay, so basically each output in the muith example will be the muith input example dotted with the unknown regression vector plus the noise vector. And that gives us the, the output vector. Okay, um, of course, we don't get direct access to this unknown regression vector. We only get access to the training data, and we have to construct an estimate s hat of the unknown regression vector s zero. Okay. Um, so the distributional assumptions are that the components of s zero are drawn iid. Uh, so it's an it's a product distribution on, on this unknown vector, but uh, and each component is drawn from a, a, a signal distribution. This is a scalar a distribution over a scalar value. Right, this could be a non-Gaussian distribution. In fact, this theory is interesting when it is non-Gaussian. Okay. The noise, uh, each realization of the noise in the muith example is drawn IID across examples. And it's drawn from a, another noise distribution, P of epsilon, P sub epsilon, which could be non-Gaussian. Okay. So now the question is, what is the procedure that we use to go from data to an estimate? So what we're going to analyze is a wide class of algorithms uh, known in the statistics literature as M estimation. The basic idea is you take the data as input and you minimize a loss function and a regular. By the way, I can't see the chat. So um, maybe if anybody has questions, uh, just feel free to ask in the chat and the moderator can, uh, uh, can just let me know. And, and I'm happy to take questions as we go along. It's much more important that I, I'm clear than that I finish the talk. Sure. Um, sure. I, I I can I can monitor the the chat for you. So awesome. you prefer to have the questions during the talk or at the end? Um, I, I think uh, 
yeah, whenever people want, um, okay, maybe sure, like okay. clarif clarifying questions for sure, sure, ask sure. during the talk. Um, no problem, yeah. And even non-clarifying questions, I'm happy to take. <laughs> if, if you uh, uh, attacking questions, right. I'm happy to take as well. <laughs> not, not a, not a Adversarial problem. questions. Adversarial right. questions, yeah. Awesome. All right, all right. <laughs> okay. Yeah, uh, it might lengthen the talk, but that's okay. Um, so, so anyway, so um, yeah, so the procedure to go from data to the estimate it, uh, so, so basically what we're going to do is we're going to minimize uh, a, an objective function with respect to a loss function and a regularizer. So what the loss, so what we're going to do is the estimated uh, regression vector will be an optimization over all possible regression vectors S. Okay. We're going to minimize a loss function which penalizes uh, uh, deviations in measurements. So X mu dot S is the noise-free measurement, we output measurement we would have gotten had the unknown regression vector been S, but Y mu is the measurement that we did get. So we're gonna penalize discrepancies between our prediction and our actual measurements using this loss function. Okay, this loss function is, using, is monotonically increasing in its argument. We may also wish to regularize our unknown regression vector using a regularization function. Okay. How are we gonna measure how well we did? Uh, we're just gonna use an L2 discrepancy between our estimated signal and the true signal. Of course, when we're solving the problem, we don't have access to the true signal. But as a theorist, when I'm scoring different loss functions and regularizers, I'm gonna score them by how well the estimated signal is to the ground truth signal, just in an L2 sense, okay? We're interested in the high dimensional statistics limit where N and P are going to infinity, but their ratio is order one. And in this limit, this random quantity concentrates to basically a deterministic value, which I'm going to call Q sub S, that depends on the measurement density alpha, the loss function rho, the regularizer sigma, the noise distribution P sub epsilon, and the signal distribution P sub S. And the major questions we're going to ask are, for a given signal and noise distribution and measurement density alpha, what is the performance? And moreover, what is the best possible performance across the choice of loss function and regularizer rho and sigma? Okay. Now, just to, to connect to things that you're probably familiar with, um, almost all of the algorithms that we know and love are special cases of this general framework. For example, least squares is just a quadratic loss, no regularizer. Maximum likelihood estimation occurs when the uh, uh, loss function is the minus the log probability of the noise and no regularizer. Similarly, map, a maximum a posteriori inference, is where the loss function is the minus log probability of the noise and the regularizer is the minus log probability of the signal. And then other things like ridge regression is both quadratic loss and quadratic regularizer, and then lasso and, and <laughs> elastic net. Um, okay, so, uh, so, so we kind of have an embarrassment of riches, right? There's many, many, many possible ways to solve this problem. And we'd like to obtain theoretical clarity as to what is the best way to do it, okay? Uh, over the choice of loss and regularizer. Okay, so again, we, we set this up as a statistical physics problem. Uh, uh, so so you, can think of, you, you can think of this objective function as an energy function where the thermal degrees of freedom is the unknown regression vector S. These are the parameters of our statistical model. The data is what it is. It's like quench disorder. Uh, it, it comes from the generative model and we're not free to change it, so it's quenched. And the way we're gonna set this up is gonna, we're gonna create a Boltzmann distribution over the unknown regression vector. That's the usual distribution e to the minus beta energy uh, over a partition function. And this is a random Boltzmann distribution because of the randomness in X mu and Y mu. And we're gonna take the zero temperature limit or beta goes to infinity. And this distribution will concentrate on the ground state of this energy function, which is the solution to this optimization problem. And this becomes an order parameter that we can compute analytically. Okay. Again, using the replica method, and I won't bore you with all of those technical details, all of the calculations are in the paper. But what's interesting is the answer is actually quite intuitive. Okay, so let me give you the answer in a special case. So we're able to compute, uh, we're able to compute this function for arbitrary choices uh, here. Okay, uh, well, arbitrary choices with a convex loss and convex regularizer. Okay, so um, so here's an example. So uh, here, the, the signal distribution is Laplacian. Sorry, the noise distribution is Laplacian, and the signal distribution is also Laplacian. Okay. 
And the optimal loss and regularizer are shown here. Uh, it turns out the optimal thing to do depends on how many measurements you took, right? So at very, very high measurement density, it turns out the, you can prove, well, this calculation shows that the optimal loss function and optimal regularizer correspond to map estimation, right? The minus log, the loss is the minus log probability of the noise. So it's the absolute value function and the regularizer is the minus log probability of the signal. So it's the absolute value function here. But as you reduce the measurement density, it, uh, it is beneficial to actually smooth the map uh, loss and regularizer in a certain nonlinear way. Okay? And we provide an algorithmic prescription for smoothing it. It involves computing what's called a Moreau envelope and, and so forth. But those are all technical details. But the basic idea is the optimal thing to do is to smooth the, the map estimator in a certain way. And what's interesting is this nonlinear smoothing operation in the limit of very, very small measurement density yields a quadratic loss and a quadratic regularizer independent of the signal and noise distribution here up to a certain constraint, which I'll state next, okay? And in particular, that constraint is log concave signal and noise distributions, right? So as long as the, um, as long as these, as long as the logarithm of the distribution is a concave function, that, then everything I said holds, right? The reason we need this log concavity assumption is for a technical reason in the replica calculations. Um, uh, having to do with replica symmetry uh, preservation. But I, anyways, um, so what the, so the statement we can make is for any log concave signal and noise distribution, the optimal loss and regularizer are nonlinearly smooth versions of MAP where the smoothing increases as the measurement density decreases. MAP is optimal at high measurement density and ridge regression with quadratic loss and quadratic regularizer is optimal at low measurement density independent of the signal and noise. Doesn't matter what they are as long as they're log concave, okay? We also prove that, or, or, or calculate that, uh, we also compute the Bayes optimal solution, right? So in the setting where our, our performance characteristic is the squared error or deviation between the estimate and the true distribution, we know the minimum mean squared error estimate involves computing, computing the posterior mean of S given the data under the generative model. That's a high dimensional integral, right? Not an optimization problem. But we can show that if you solve our optimal optimization problem, your answer will coincide with the posterior mean. Therefore, you will minimize the mean squared error. Therefore, no inference algorithm can outperform our optimal algorithm, right? So we've proven zero gap between what's achievable uh, and what our algorithm achieves. Right? Okay, so now just to give you um, an illustration, uh, again, with this running example of Laplacian noise and signal, uh, these are the performance characteristics of various algorithms. This is the measurement density on the, on the x-axis. And this is the fractional error between s hat and s zero on the, on the y-axis, right? Um, this is the map. Uh, this is the map estimate. The solid curves are predictions of our analytic theory. The error bars are um, numerical uh, verification of our theory obtained from uh, solving um, finite size problems. And you can see there's a nice match between theory and numerics for all three uh, for all for these two algorithms, a uh, map and quadratic, which is ridge. You can see that map indeed does better than ridge at high measurement density. And eventually it will approach the optimal one, which is the black one. But ridge actually does better than map at low measurement density. And as predicted, its performance approaches that of the optimal algorithm, uh, even at moderate measurement densities. Okay. And uh, so what, what's interesting is uh, if you don't have that much data, don't pay that much attention to your signal and noise distribution. Just do ridge regression and you'll do much better. Okay. So, so, and that, that, there's, that's, that's actually a nice fortuitous intersection between statistical efficiency and computational efficiency because ridge can be much more uh, efficient than map, especially if you have strange uh, signal and noise distributions. Okay, so all the details are in these two papers. Here's where we calculated the, uh, so, sorry, here's where we calculated everything and here's we showed there was zero gap between uh, the Bayes optimal solution and our, our solution. Okay, so, um, Let's see, before moving on to the next topic, maybe I can pause and see if there's any questions on this topic.
Uh, I guess we don't have any questions so far. Okay. But, so if uh, actually, if people want to ask questions, they can also uh, raise their uh, their hands. So if you click on reactions, you have raise hand, uh, and then I can uh, you know I can interrupt the speaker. Uh, but I guess no questions so far. So okay, sounds good. Uh, let's let's yeah, keep going. Sounds, then. Sounds um, good. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So. Uh... Okay, so now we're going to shift topics. And I, I think this is kind of a fun and very simple story, actually, where we derive, uh, again, the structure of the primate in uh, retina ab initio, just by looking or peering into the structure of the physical world. Okay. And, and we use machine learning as an intermediary between the physical world and the primate retina. Um, so just a, just a, a, a review of the, the primate retina. So, um, your primate, you know, our retina and the monkey retina are, are, are quite similar um, uh, to first order, uh, probably also to second and third order. But um, so, so we all have photoreceptors, right? These photoreceptors can detect single photons. They have that much sensitivity, especially in, in dark conditions. Uh, it's actually a one hidden layer neural network. There's a hidden layer of bipolar cells. And then uh, these bipolar cells map to the ganglion cells. And you have some lateral connectivity here, American cells. And, and horizontal cells. Uh, we all have 1 million optic nerve fibers that go from our retina to our brain. And everything we know about the visual world comes only through those 1 million optic nerve fibers. Okay, now how do we model uh, this, this primate retina? We often model it using a convolutional neural network, basically, uh, where each of these ganglion cells has a spatial temporal filter, right? You can think of this as a convolutional filter. Uh, that's that's replicated. The retina is roughly translation invariant, modulo uh, details about the density of cells that varies across eccentricity, which are actually quite interesting. But if you focus on the center of the retina, it's roughly translation invariant. And so you have so each ganglion cell has the same space-time convolutional filter that's that's uh, copied across uh, space. Um, but there's actually multiple channels actually. So um, so just like our CNNs and machine vision have multiple channels, i.e. The different convolutional filter for one channel replicated across space, and then another channel has another convolutional filter replicated across space. The primate retina also has that. In fact, it has 20 convolutional channels. The four dominant convolutional channels that comprise about 70% of all of the cells in the primate retina look like this. They're 3D, uh, or, or you know, two dimensions of space and one dimension of time. Their 3D convolutional cell filters are approximately space time separable. So the, the outer product of a spatial filter and a temporal filter. So I'm showing you the spatial filter and temporal filter for four primate retinal cell types. And this is real data collected from my collaborator, E.J. Chichelinsky's lab at Stanford. Okay, um, so if we look at these uh, convolutional filters, um, this is what's called, a, an, a, let's start with the midgets. Okay, so midgets, uh, you, it's all intuitive, it's like small, right? So these, these receptive fields are small in space. So this is what this means is this cell likes to pool with one sign from, from uh, photoreceptor inputs that are localized in this region. And it has an inhibition from the surround, a, a faint red thing here. This is the same, except it has the opposite sign. So, so basically this one responds to a contrast increment. If the light goes up in the center and down in the surround, it responds a lot. Here, if the light goes down in the surround and up in the center, it responds a lot. Okay, that's this filter. And it has a characteristic time course of integration that's relatively fast, okay? Now, so, so this is called the midget cell because its receptive field or filter size is quite small. There's a parasol cell, which has a larger receptive field, okay, relative to the midget cell. And it comes in the on and the off flavor as well. And it has a different characteristic of, of temporal integration speed. Okay, so this is this is what we're this is what evolution has found, right? Can we explain why evolution found this, uh, and is it matched somehow optimally to reflect the structure of our physical world, right? Um, so, by the way, in, in neuroscience, uh, there's a huge effort because of technological advances to be able to try to measure all of the cell types in the brain, and by cell type, they often mean genetically identified cell types. 
that correspond to clusters of gene expression patterns in, in the full space of all possible gene expression patterns. This is driven by advances or an ability to do single cell mRNA sequencing. Um, what's lacking though, is we don't have a theory for why we have so many cell types. And this is one of the first theories to sort of address this in the retina, okay? All right, so just to summarize, um, it turns out that, so you have these two types of cells, they also come in on and off flavors. The midget cells have a small spatial receptive field and it turns out they are slow to integrate over time. The parasol cells have a large receptive field and it turns out they integrate fast in time. There's a lot of midget cells and they're not very sensitive. They don't, it takes a lot to make them fire, it turns out. The parasol cells, there's not that many of them, but they're very, very sensitive. Uh, a, a small amount of light input will make them fire, okay? And these co correspond to about 70% of all primate cell types in the retina, right? So a, a major open question was why is space and time intertwined in this fashion? Why are the receptive fields that are small in space also slow in time? And why are the receptive fields that are large in space fast in time, right? It turns out these will follow from these properties. Okay, so what we did was we said, okay, let's, um, let's look at the structure of natural movies and assume that we have a convolutional neural network that's optimally processing natural movies. Okay, the very movies whose statistics presumably sculpted the evolution of the retina. We're going to parameterize the set of all possible retinas by these linear uh, uh, spatial temporal filters, okay? And we're going to score how well these filters do by asking how well we can just linearly decode or reconstruct the movie, okay? Subject to some noise and subject to some overall firing rate budget. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at convolutional neural networks with only one channel or convolutional neural networks with two or more channels. These channels correspond to the cell types that, that we talked about. So this orange cell type or channel has one type of filter that's replicated across space and the blue one has another type of filter that's replicated across space. We're going to do an apples to apples comparison between this multi-channel model and the single channel model by matching the total number of neurons and by matching the overall average firing rate. So we're doing a constrained optimization of uh, reconstruction capacity subject to a constraint on neuron number and energy consumption or firing rate. Okay. So I just have a quick question. I don't know, uh, yeah. not many questions in the chat, so maybe I'll just ask one here. Uh, so what do you mean by uh, natural movie? What, what okay, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna, to? exactly, I'm gonna get to that. So, okay, sure. um, okay, so, uh, so, so yeah, so this is the set of models. So yeah, what do I mean by natural movie? Because this model is a linear model, it depends on the statistical structure of movies only through their second order statistics. Because movie statistics is basically translation invariant in space and time, you can summarize the second order statistics by the power spectrum, i.e. how much power is there at a certain spatial frequency K and a certain uh, temporal frequency omega. And this is the power spectrum shown as a heat map where red is high power and blue is low power. The structure of natural movies has an interesting power law structure. It's roughly, a, it, it factorizes into a power law over space and a power law over time. So contours of equal power look like hyperbolas in this plane. And uh, there's kind of two regions that have high power, one at high spatial frequency, low temporal frequency, and one at low temporal frequency and high spatial frequency, All right? So um, this is what the power spectrum of natural movies look like. And what we did in the, in the paper was we, give, we, we took this power spectrum with quantitative parameters taken from published papers and we optimize these filters uh, subject to this de decoding loss. And, and what we showed was that with two channels, uh, you can do better than you can with even with one channel, even if you control for the same number of neurons and same overall firing rate. And the reason you can do better is because the two channels will specialize to process these two lobes of the power spectrum, right? One channel will focus here and one channel will focus here. In this model, the optimal filter tries to spread itself across here and it doesn't do as well, right? Now, if we examine what's going on here, right? The cell type or channel that specializes to have its filter have uh, amplitude where the, the signal has power here, it has high spatial frequency. So its receptive field will be small in space and it's forced to have low temporal frequency. So it'll integrate slowly in time. 
you need to tile space. So if your receptive field is small, you need many, many cells to tile space without having gaps. So you need lots and lots of cells. But if you have lots and lots of cells, if you don't want to bust your firing rate budget, you better not allow them to fire a lot. Okay. And that's exactly what midget cells look like. Now the parasol cells, um, they concentrate on low spatial frequency. So the receptive field width must be large. And they also, be, by virtue of the structure of natural movies, they have to concentrate on high temporal frequency. So they'll integrate with a fast temporal filter. Because the receptive fields are large, you don't need that many of them to tile space. And because you don't need that many of them, you can have them fire a lot without busting your firing rate budget. So these are the main qualitative features of midget and parasol cells. And we, we can compute, by the way, I'm just telling you kind of the story at a qualitative level. We actually have mathematical formulas for the optimal filters and so forth. And there's a nice water filling analogy to the optimization process, but in any case. So then what we did was to introduce the on and the off thing, on and the off aspects of these cells. We actually optimized numerically. So, so here we could do everything analytically. Then what we did was we, forced the autoencoder to basically be have rectified linear units in the interior, right? A and then we optimized the filters numerically. Um, and this is what we found. Uh, so again, this was the data that I showed you in the earlier slide. And this is what we got from numerically optimizing a convolutional autoencoder by using the quantitative structure of natural movies. And we found receptive fields that match the structure of the primate retina, right? Uh, pretty quantitatively, especially if you compute the ratio of the width of this receptive field to this receptive field. So basically, the, you know, this was actually, for us, we were actually really pleasantly surprised. Uh, we take into account the structure of the physical world, namely the second order systems natural movies. We optimize a very simple model, a, a multi-channel convolutional autoencoder, and out pops the primate retina. So this suggests that evolution uh, found a really nice convolutional neural network to optimally reconstruct natural movies, give it a limited firing rate budget and a limited um, uh, number of neurons. Okay. So all of the details are, are, are in this paper here. Okay. So let me, um, let's see. Okay, so I'm gonna go through this talk in a different order because of the, uh, uh, the particular conference that, that, that I'm speaking at here. So I'm gonna to jump to the more physics-y aspect of, of computing with atoms and photons. And then if there's time, I'll come back to this. There, there might actually be time to come back to this uh, exact lattices thing. Okay, so if there's no questions, I will switch to uh, this topic of uh, quantum neuromorphic computing with atoms and photons. Um, so let me go to there. Okay, so here we're kind of shifting it, right? Before we've been using physics to understand machine learning or using the structure of the physical world to understand the brain, using machine learning as an intermediary. Here, we're going to try to see if we can exploit the, phys the natural physical dynamics of the world at the level of individual atoms and photons and harness that natural physics dyna physical, physical dynamics for computation. And it, it, it turns out in some ways we can, uh, um, and what's interesting is in the classical limit of these systems, the natural physical dynamics reduces to slight twists on classical neural networks that would look like, you know, recurrent neural networks. Okay, so the, and there's kind of two stories here, two types of uh, uh, quantum computing devices. One is a Bose-Einstein condensate that's uh, uh, situated in an optical cavity that's stuck between these two mirrors. Um, so here, what happens is you have these atoms that have atomic spins, right? I won't go into the details of all the, the quantum dynamics, all of this, and I'll just explain it at a very high level. Um, you have these atoms that, that have atomic spins. So you can roughly think of these atomic spins. It's either spin up or spin down or plus or minus one, okay? You have light uh, reverberating back and forth through the cavity reflecting between these mirrors. So they set up these standing wave patterns of light and they're actually multiple modes in this cavity. It's not just a, a single mode cavity. So you have this complicated uh, standing wave pattern of light. It's all powered by a, a pump laser that's transverse to the reflecting pattern of light between the mirrors. And it's actually a dissipative quantum system because light can leak out of this mirror 
to the outside world. That's actually fortunate because then my collaborators can image the light and see what's happening, wh wh whether the spins are up and down. So basically in terms of the light patterns of these spins dissipate out into the outside world, you can read off the spins and see if they're spin up or spin down. Now the spins are exchanging photons because light is bouncing back and forth between this, this cavity. And the exchange of photons can cause the spins to flip, okay, from up to down states. All right, so roughly in this analogy, you can think of the atomic spins as neurons with states that are plus or minus one. You can think of the photons as synapses that implement a particular spin flip rate determined by a connectivity JIJ. And uh, my quantum optics collaborators worked out the dynamics of the system and showed that it reduced uh, to energy minimization dynamics because again, it's a dissipative system. It dissipates energy to the outside world. So the dynamics of spins effectively looks like energy minimization where this is the energy function, where the JIJ or the connectivity, so, so the connectivity between spin I and spin J is determined by the physical position of spin I and spin J and the light intensity pattern at, at the two locations of spin I and spin J. So this JIJ comes from the light connectivity pattern, light patterns, okay? So this is the energy minimization. It turns out this is a low rank matrix where the rank corresponds to the number of um, modes in the cavity. And it actually looks like a hot field connectivity uh, uh, network, okay? So what this system can do is it can actually store multiple memories in the following way, right? So I don't know if, uh, um, I, I didn't have a tutorial slide on hot field networks. This is, this is, this is um, as close as I get to a tutorial slide here, but, but let me, but, but I think this will be enough. So basically, if we think about this energy function, it's a function over all spin configurations. So if we think of this domain as a set of all spin configurations, because the connectivity is low rank, there'll be a small number of minima, all right? We can think of those minima as memories that the system likes to store, all right? Um, here are two, two example memories. We, we've kind of illustrated the memories as an image, right? But really this, this, this minimum is an entire configuration of N spins. We can visualize that spin configuration as an image where maybe black is spin up and white is spin down. And so this is sort of one memory. And this is another memory. They used particular elements from the periodic table uh, corresponding to atoms that actually go into these cavities. All right, so um, now the process of memory retrieval um, corresponds to presenting a corrupted pattern, right? That may be some hamming distance away from the real, from the actual memory pattern. And energy minimization, minimization will hopefully take you to the minimum, and then you can recall the, the clean pattern. Right? So here are examples of different types of, of corruptions, like a partial pattern gets completed to a, 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 an actual memory, a, a, a pixelated noise pattern gets, gets completed to a clean pattern, and a misspelling can get uh, uh, completed as well. Right? Of course, there are many competing minima, so you have to be within the basin of attraction of the clean memory. So you can't tolerate arbitrary corruptions. Okay? So Hopfield, you know, back in the 80s used this to model memory and biological systems as well. Um, and and um, yeah, so um, now usually I, I haven't specified what is the dynamics of the system, right? I've just told you that it minimizes energy, but how does it minimize energy? Usually in statistical mechanics or in neuroscience or in Markov chain Monte Carlo, when we're um, minimizing such energy functions, we follow the so-called Glauber dynamics or, or closely related metropolis hastings dynamics. What we do, and the reason I'm talking about this dynamics is because the dynamics of the emergent cavity coming from the quantum mechanics is actually quite different. So I want to set this up as a contrast. So what we often do in many, many fields is to minimize this energy. We, we flip a spin at random, right? We compute the change in the energy. If the energy went down, we accept the spin flip. On the other hand, if the energy went up, we, expect the, we accept the spin flip with some probability that's e to the minus change in energy, right? Uh, divided by the temperature, okay? So the idea is at high temperature, we're willing to tolerate some increases in energy. At zero temperature, we don't tolerate any increases in energy, right? We, we just only accept random spin flips if they reduce the energy. 
Uh, if you analyze the dynamics of this cavity QED system, it obeys a different dynamics. What it does is it sort of does a quantum parallel search over all possible end spins to find the spin whose flip would lower the energy the most, right? So it's, it's doing an implicit maximization operation, operation over all end spins for free uh, to find the spin that would lower the energy the most. And it flips specifically that spin, okay? So we call the steepest descent dynamics. And what we found numerically is that the steepest descent dynamics has quite different properties uh, than this classical Glauber dynamics in terms of memory capacity. Okay, so the oh, way can, that we- Can, can, I, can oh, yeah. I ask a question here? So, um, sure. so what do you mean by um, memory recall and, and, and memories? This is related to like storing information like in like a yeah, computer it, memory or, or is something different? Yeah, it's related to storing information. So. Um, the, the classical setting in the application of neuroscience is the following, right? You, you see at a con you're at a conference, you see the, um, you hear the name and see the face of a person, right? The next time you see them, you see their face, but you need to recall their name. So the way you think about how that happens is you see the name and face of a person and you create a new minimum in the energy landscape of neural networks in your brain. Uh, I mean, that's a model at least. And then the next time you see their face, you land in the basin of attraction of that thing, you flow back down, and then you can say their name. That, that's the, 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 the basic idea. In this cavity system, the minima are given to us by the structure of the cavity, and we came up with a translation procedure to take arbitrary patterns that we like to store and translate them into patterns that the cavity likes to store. So, so basically, um, we're defining memories to be the minima of the energy function. And we're defining the recall process to be presenting a corrupted pattern and completing the pattern. Right? So, so that's the that's the framework uh, of application. That's the use case, so to speak, of the Hopfield model. Right? Okay, so so we, we can get more quantitative about that. So what we can do is we can find a memory, right? Okay, so so I, in these systems, there's a trade-off between the number of memories you can store and the size of their basin of attraction, which is equivalent to the degree of noise that you can tolerate in the re retrieval process, right? So we, we need to understand that trade-off. So, so what we can do is we can do numerical experiments on uh, connectivities that come from this cavity or, or other connectivities. And we can ask, um, you know, let's say you, let's say you find a memory, which is an energy minimum, right? And you, uh, you start at some corrupted version of that energy minimum that's some hamming distance away from that energy minimum, right? And then you let the dynamics run, whether it's the Glauber dynamics or whether it's the steepest descent dynamics, you let it run and you ask, do I come back to that original memory? Okay, if you start close to the original memory with very high probability, you come back to that original memory. But as you get to a higher and higher distance, there's a chance you'll flow to another memory, not the one that you want to recall, right? So if you look at zero temperature Metropolis Hastings, uh, the, uh, the recall curve, so the recall curve is the probability of recall as a function of the distance or, or the level of noise. The recall curve isn't that great, but if you switch to um, the steepest descent dynamics, you immediately boost up the entire recall curve. Okay, this is for a small problem size. So, so uh, having, you, you basically double the size of the basin of attraction. Um, so, uh, okay, so, so we can define the basin size where we define some threshold criterion for recall, which is you come back to the memory at some 95% probability, and we can define the basin size at, at which that's no longer true, the, min the minimum hanging distance which that's no longer true. So this is our definition of the basin size. It's readily measurable in numerical experiments. So here, what we did is we then computed the average basin size as a function of the memory loading, the ratio of the number of memories to the number of neurons. This is another interesting manifestation of the high dimensional statistics limit. All of the, some of these th things curves can be computed at, uh, uh, asymptotically exactly in the limit where n goes to infinity, p goes to infinity, and the ratio is order one. Okay, this is a famous uh, classical Hopfield network, okay? As you increase the memories, the basin size drops dramatically until it suddenly drops to zero uh, or something that's order one, not, not order n, okay? Uh, as n goes to infinity. 
So this, this is the famous phase transition where the hot field model undergoes a phase transition from a memory, an associative memory system to a spin glass like system, right? Um, uh, there's better algorithms out there than the hot field model, for example, the pseudo inverse model and also our cavity system. And as you can see, for example, in our cavity system, if you switch from zero temperature Metropolis Hastings to steepest descent, you get a better trade off between memory capacity in the horizontal axis and memory robustness of the vertical axis. So you, you ameliorate this trade off. Also, for a better rule called the pseudo inverse learning rule, if you switch from the natural Glauber dynamics or zero temperature Metropolis Hastings to our quantum steepest descent dynamics, you again ameliorate this trade off. Uh, you get a better robustness for any given uh, memory loading. So, what's interesting is the dynamics of the cavity alone is quite interesting. It doesn't matter what your learning rule is or your rule for, for storing memories. If you switch from the classical uh, dynamics to the more quantum dynamics, you do better in terms of this trade off between robustness and memory. Okay. All right. So, um, I'm going to shift now to a different quantum computer uh, that another set of my colleagues uh, worked on. Uh, uh, namely Yoshi Yamamoto, um, who, who was kind of a leader in inventing this the so-called coherent icing machine. Okay, so it's a different quantum computer which doesn't use atoms. So, well, I mean, it does use atoms in the sense that it uses mirrors and so forth, but the, the primary qubits are photon polarization states, right? So photons uh, have two polarization states, depending on the basis. It could be right circularly polarized or left circularly polarized. And those are like the, the, the two quantum states of the photon. Okay, they create a very interesting uh, uh, quantum optic device where you can get the photons to go round and round in a ring, and through various measure, uh, um, through various uh, mirrors and phase delay devices and optical parametric oscillators, which I won't have time to go to, you can get the photon polarization states of the multiple photons to interact with each other in a coherent manner. Okay. Now, what's interesting is if, again, if you work out the, the, the low energy kind of effective dynamics of the system, especially in the classical limit, you again get an icing type interaction. But now the here where the, the connectivity was determined by the positions of the atoms in the cavity, here the connectivity is arbitrarily programmable. You can program any JIJ by programming the phase delays and so forth in the system, right? So what they applied this for was to try to solve NP-hard optimization problems. So there are many, many uh, optimization problems uh, like max cut or vertex cover or so forth that can be mapped to an equivalent icing problem where you know, if you give me an optimization problem, there are algorithms to, to explain that combinatorial optimization problem or realize that combination pro optimization problem as minimizing this uh, icing energy function for a particular choice of JIJs that depends on the problem, okay? All right, so, okay, sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, this is the icing energy minimization problem. Uh, so, so this is an interesting problem precisely because many NP-hard problems map to it, okay? What does the energy function of this system look like, right? Well, the, the photon polarization, uh, if you take into account also quantum amplitude and so forth, in the classical limit can be specified as a real number, not as a binary spin. And this is the energy function over a collection of n real numbers. There's a single photon energy function that looks like a double well potential. I'll go into this later. Plus there's this quadratic interaction between the photon polarization. So now X is a real number in the classical limit. And this is the energy function, okay? This function here has a parameter in it A which physically maps to this pump parameter, it's a laser pump that powers the system. If A is less than zero, then this is a quadratic function, right? And all the photons die, they go to kind of zero in, the, in, the state, in their ground state. On the other hand, uh, if you turn on the pump power above a certain threshold, which here is, is zero, this function becomes a double well potential and, and A is bigger than zero. And so the photon can assume two stable polarization states. This is a single photon energy function. But the photons interact in the system and so you also get this quadratic function. In the limit of very large A, these wells become extremely deep. And so this system, if you minimize energy on it, it will become equivalent to the icing energy uh, function, which maps to NP-hard problems. So a very interesting question is, 
can we use the natural dynamics of the system to solve NP-hard problems? Of course, we're not going to change the scaling, but but uh, uh, of but 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 can we do it a, a, you know a little bit faster? And in particular, this raises very interesting questions about how hard is it to optimize this landscape? Why is it hard? And can we anneal this landscape in interesting ways by slowly cranking up the laser gain parameter, going from a quadratic function to a, a, a non-convex function? Okay, so we were able to solve these questions theoretically. We could ask, uh, well, in the case where JIJ was a random Gaussian uh, connectivity, this corresponds to the famous Sherrington Kirkpatrick spin glass, where here JIJ are IID random variables that have zero mean and are otherwise uh, have some variance. Okay, so, but for this continuous problem, we were able to answer where do the local minima lie? Where do the saddle points lie? Where does the global minima lie? What is the Hessian eigen spectrum? Can energy minima be found with gradient descent? And what happens if we anneal the laser power? Okay, and this is what we found. The theoretical techniques we used were the catch rice formula, which allows us to com uh, compute uh, the number of minima at a given energy level and a given location state space and the replica method. And I'll just summarize the phase diagram that we found. So this horizontal axis, and by the way, this was done, these are beautiful calculations done by my grad student, Atsushi Yamamura. So I'll summarize the phase diagram. So this is the laser pump power uh, parameter A, and this is the energy level, okay? At negative pump power, it's just a quadratic well, and the second term is quadratic. So everything vanishes, you, you go to a vacuum state here. As you turn on the pump power, this double well, sorry, this double well potential turns on. And what happens to the landscape is you get exponentially many minima, and they're all at the same energy level, right? Uh, the global minimum is at the same level as all the local minima. As you turn on the pump power a little bit more, you get exponentially many local minima, but the global minima is a little bit even lower, right? And this, this effect becomes more magnified. So this is the energy level of the global minima. This blue line is the energy level of typical minima. The, the orange line is our theoretical calculation from the catch rise formula and the replica method. The blue dots are um, exhaustive optimizations that we've done in systems of moderate size, like N equals 20, 30, 40, okay? And you can see there's a very beautiful match between our theoretical calculations and experiments. There's also a match here. We just don't have that data on the slide. So now, what happens if you want to solve this original icing problem? You might think you just crank the system up to large A really quickly and let the, let the system cool or lower its energy, but then you'll be in trouble. You won't be able to get to the global minima. You'll be stuck at this wall of local minima. However, you might try to anneal the system by slowly cranking up A. So you fall into one of these local minima and then you slowly follow, uh, follow it and get down. And if we do that, we find that we actually find a really good solution to the Sherrington Kirkpatrick spin glass. Um, this, this dashed line is the best that you can do computed from theory here. And these blue dots are what we, what we can do. And, 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 this is, and this is for different problem sizes. Um, so we can actually find really good ground states of the ice in Hamiltonian by solving a different optimization problem that falls naturally out of these photons where we slowly crank up the laser power and we can descend below this wall of local minima to get to the global minimum and then get good performance here. And so that, I know that was really quick, but I'll stop here because I'm, I'm two minutes over now. Um, okay, thanks. So yeah, I'll, I'll stop and I'm happy to take questions. Uh, I can stick around for a while and take any questions. Okay, great. Yeah, thank you very much for this. Uh, this, this great talk definitely covered uh, a lot of different topics here. Um, so we have uh, five minutes or so uh, for, um, for, for questions. Uh, so yeah, we're, we have sort of a 10 minute, 10 minute break now, but um, we can use that time for, uh, for questions. So any questions from the, the audience? So you can either put it in a chat or you can uh, raise your hand. Yeah. And if you're interested in details, uh, these are all the references and the red ones are the ones that I covered today. Um, Okay, Except great. This one. Maybe you can stay on this slide a little bit. Yeah, yeah, sure. So I just have a maybe a quick question about the NP hard problem. So can you talk a little bit about this? So uh, yeah, I, I, so, I didn't completely uh, understand. So you, you you can solve somehow NP hard problem oh, with yeah, this okay, quantum, so, 
on the machines yeah, so, or, or how, what's so the story not, there? Um, yeah, okay, so that's part of an older story. So this, these coherent ICE machines have been around for a while and they've been benchmarking it against various solvers for uh, various optimization problems. Um, and, it, and it does pretty well in, in multiple benchmarks. So obviously like NP hard is actually a little bit of a weak concept, right? It's saying you have a class of problems where there exists at least what, oops, sorry. Um, there exists a class of problems. I'm sorry, my, <laughs> my phone's connected to my computer with Bluetooth. Uh, and it's, I, I shut off my phone, but the Bluetooth is still going. Let me turn off Bluetooth. Okay, there we go. Oh, it's still going, okay. Anyways, um, it'll go away in a bit. Um, yeah, so uh, let's see, um, where was I? It just means there's an ensemble of problems right. where at least one instance takes exponential time in the problem size. But if you look at random instances, uh, depending on the complexity, some random instances are easy and some random instances are hard. Regardless, you can apply various optimizers to random instances and you can benchmark them against them against the current icing machine. And in wall clock time, the current icing machine always outperforms it because it's using the natural dynamics of, of individual photons. Even in terms of the number of random iterations for some ensembles of problems, uh, when you simulate it, it also does pretty well. Um, so, so that's kind of the story there. Of course, I'm by no means saying that P equals NP, right? I mean, the scaling of the time to solve a problem with these worst case problem instances, mm -hmm. the size of these worst case problem instances will likely scale exponentially with N. So okay. if you, you know, if you go from like uh, CMOS to photons, you're not going to beat that exponential. You're, you're going to cut down a, a constant, but you're not going to beat that exponential. But of course, like the natural problems that occur in the real world, even if they come from classes that have one NP, uh, have one or more NP hard instances, the natural distribution problems that we, we actually solve are not like the hard instances. Um, right, so right. There's a lot of uh, work on average case complexity to be done in theory and practice. I, I, that was a kind of a long winded answer, but I hope that makes sense. Okay, so actually there, there is uh, a question and a, uh, from Surav. Uh, Surav, do you wanna unmute and ask your question or otherwise I can just read your question uh, aloud? Sure, I, I can go ahead and ask. Okay, thank you, um, great. Thank you for the fantastic talk. There were quite a lot of very interesting and new topics uh, that we encountered today. Uh, I had a quick question about the first uh, topic that you discussed today. You had some ideas about uh, the the loss and regularization uh, question for convex optimization problems, if I understand correctly. Uh, yeah. Does this do we have any ideas that can extend also to the machine learning regression uh, problems where the loss landscape may not always be a convex function? Yeah, yeah, we we and others have have worked on that, and um, what's happening is that that people are. Um, People, so, so for, by the way, um, this is a non-convex uh, energy landscape, right? And here we were able to compute where the global minima and local minima rise. And, and uh, uh, I, I didn't cover this, but we can also compute the Hessian analytically and compare it to numerical numerics and they agree. So, so what's happening is um, toy neural network problems that physicists have studied as well as spin glasses provide really interesting toy examples of non-convex error landscapes that have certain universal properties. In particular, as you crank up some complexity measure, you have these types of phase transitions where you have many local minima, global minimum and, and, uh, that, that might have a gap or may not have a gap and so forth. And people have been done doing numerical studies that compare the dynamics of energy minimization in these physical models to the dynamics of loss minimization in machine learning models. And they see various points of uh, agreement and various points of discrepancy and so forth. And so th there's a slow closing of the gap between physics and machine learning that's happened there, happening there. And there's a long literature uh, on that. If you're interested in that literature, we did review it uh, in, our, in our statistical mechanics of deep learning ar uh, article, which I'm, actually, I'm not sure if that's on the screen, but I flashed it at the beginning. Um, so I think that's a good entry point uh, into that literature. We have an entire section on, on in that review article on loss landscapes, non-convex loss landscapes and modeling them and doing experiments on them. Thank you so much. I was I was gonna 
try and go ahead and read through it, but thank you for pointing that out. Sure. Yeah, actually, I pasted the. I think I pasted the link in the in the chat. Should be the. It's statistical mechanics of deep learning. Yeah, I'll, I'll just quickly go back. Yeah, to... so it's it's the link is in the chat. If you want, if people are interested in this, they can just follow the the link to have the, the reference here. I think we need to to wrap it up because the next talk is at ten ten. Right, exactly. So yeah, thank you very much, uh, Surya, for this this great talk. Lots of uh, <laughs> just. Yeah. A lot of uh, fantastic uh, ideas. Uh, so yeah. yeah. So if you're, if you get, yeah, if you guys are interested, you can uh, go to the proceedings, and you can have more information on this on this topic, and also uh, references and so on. If you want to learn more about this, you can also uh, send uh, direct messages in the chat to to Surya. If you click on his name, then you can directly uh, message him inside the, inside Zoom. Sounds good. Like Okay, awesome. Thank you, uh, Surya. Thanks. So, uh,